I was depleting. <laughs> we cannot afford to lose any sun. Can a small country really survive on its own, not pulling the sun with bigger neighbours? <laughs> <laughs> The change day class have not been up. There's so much I want to talk about. I don't even know where to start. I don't want to tell you tonight. Um, so let me take 15 minutes and let me assume that more of you are probably persuaded than unpersuaded. So I am going to try and persuade the unpersuaded by telling you how we're going to transform Scotland after we win. And for the rest of you, hopefully this will just excite you a little bit about some of the possibilities. I mean, this I've done this one before. Right, one. I want to get this idea out of people's heads that after independence, everything is going to take for ages. Nothing will change. It will take forever. Because the one thing that you never go wrong with in Westminster politics is to stroke your beard and say, that can be a generational issue. It will take forever. <laughs> no, no, it doesn't have to. There's twice in the history of post war Britain where we've seen rapid and serious change in our society. One was at these governments who came in and in five years created the welfare state, an NHS, a massive program of house building, social security system, nationalised much of the um, industry sector, and he did it in five years. Five years or two. And the other great radical of the post-war period was Margaret Thatcher, who actually wasn't particularly radical in her first four years, but from about 1983 managed to pretty well undo most of what Attlee did, and it took her five years. This is the key lesson, which is politics changes things solely according to your will, not according to a macroeconomist tells you it's possible or not possible. Once you get that in your head, once you accept it's about our will, then we can decide what it is that we want to do. I'm going to suggest a few of the things that is that we might want to do. So, let's start. We've got our yes vote. What next? Well, the first thing that we've got to do is create this country as it should be. The structure of it, the underpinning, the framework of it, and that is going to mean that every single one of us in this room or at least those of us who have been active in campaigning, and those of us who haven't, where have you been? Um, <laughs> everyone in this room, everyone in this movement, everyone across Scotland is going to have to get their binoculars out so we can keep an eye on whoever it is that's doing these negotiations. If um, Alex Salmon thinks I'm reassured that he's added Alistair Darling and now that's balanced, <laughs> then I think he's probably misunderstanding what I would expect by balanced. We, as Commonweal, um, after the referendum, uh, we'll, you'll find all the details of what we're going to do. We're going to have a policy, a big policy unit set up. We're too many foundations to become common. We're going to have a big policy unit set up. One of the first things that we're going to do is keep a very close eye on what should be done for Scotland. So I say, first of all, let's go in and negotiate hard and properly. And the way to do that is not to make currency union a, a be-all and end-all of those negotiations. Because there's only one thing that we actually want from the rest of the UK, and that's currency union. They... Well, I, not all of us want that. They, on the other hand, want us to take the debt. We hold the cards. And if anybody's in doubt, I was in a panel with the head of the Institute for Fiscal Studies, and then he said was, from our look at Scotland holds all the cards. We could walk away from that debt legally, wouldn't be right, because it would fall on the heads of the people, the working people of Wales, Ireland, and England. But we could walk away from that debt perfectly legally, with no consequences of any description. Because anyone that tells you that a small independent country with no debt and massive oil reserves would find it difficult to borrow the international money from the government. We use that part, we use that, 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 um, that, that, that hand that we've been dealt with, play it hard. What we do with that is not only get a good deal for us, because what I would like to see is us setting up a Scottish currency which we control, which is going to cost maybe, I don't know, possibly 20 billion, 30 billion to get a really strong currency board, a, 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 a foreign exchange uh, reserve to enable us to pay it to sterling. But we would take that out of, of the debt, because they've said we can't get the pound, so that's fine. The cost of replacing it is something that we should remove. But I also want to see again and again that this is not just about what we can get out of it, what we can do for the world. So another thing that I would do in these negotiations is make one very simple condition. That there should be a 25% write-off of all of the debt based on a tax on the financial centre of London and on the millionaires who caused it in the first place. If they do not give us that, if they do not do that one-off tax and write off that debt, 
we take that sum off anyway, and it's for them to the answer to the people of England and Wales and Ireland to say why did they not do it. Let us set the precedent for what they should be doing, which is writing off a big chunk of that debt because of those who did it. And if we can do these things, we will get out of the negotiations with everything that we need to be a viable country. Fine, we don't need to negotiate, we just go away. We have everything we need to be a viable country, except one thing. The thing that we do not yet have is a properly functioning democracy. And that's the next thing that we have to do. This campaign, this movement has been by far the most amazing and wonderful thing I've ever been involved in. I am somewhat of a political hack. I've a political strategy for most of my life. And if you told me three years ago that you could have a mass campaign which was self-organized with no central control, with every local group fundraising for itself, managing itself, deciding what it's going to say, deciding how it's going to campaign, deciding what materials it's going to put out, deciding who it's going to invite to its meetings. If you could have that on a national level and it wouldn't be a catastrophe and all fall apart, I probably wouldn't have believed you. And sometimes it's lovely being wrong because it's been fabulous. It's been so much stronger than anything that we could have imagined if it had been managed and controlled from the centre. So why the hell do we want our politics and our democracy going forward to ever go back to being managed from the centre? We can't let it happen. I am, there, there are, I mean, I, I will say the SNP is the best of the mainstream political parties in Britain by a stretch. There's a fairly low base. <laughs> the Greens are an admirable party and the SSP may build themselves up, but someone is going to have to show me that somehow after this, come the election in 2016, there is an option there which reflects what this has become, what this country has become. A country ready for change, a country that wants to try something more than it's had, a country that is brave and confident and ready. And if what we get is more closed down politics, then that's a terrible, terrible shame. And I'm watching like a hawk, um, as, is, as are so many people, to see what happens next. And, and let me just say, I have seen in the last little while a few signs of a few of the political managers at the top would quite like to see the independence and what can I say, um, creative chaos of this campaign put back into a box. So let's not put it back into a box. And all I can say is that one of the big plans for Commonweal is to create a whole structure which doesn't control but helps and aids and facilitates the biggest and broadest grassroots movement to continue to do what it wants to do. Uh, I, I can love to tell you what we're thinking about doing, but it took far too long. <laughs> Suffice to say, at the heart of it, an incredibly powerful social media engine, which we can all join so, and organise between us. Organise and prepare. And that's the first thing that I think we have to do, is get... People always talk about starting political parties, and that may become necessary at some point. But first, let's get a clear sense of what it is that our priorities are. Let's put them down in paper, let's get them out into the world, and let's start bleeding down the necks of the parties that we have. And if they don't become better, then we do something. Because we can't accept feudal bunker politics anymore. It's no good. And once we've done that, and once we've worked and campaigned and pushed and organised into 2016 elections, then we're ready for a real programme of transformation. And where to start? so much to do. Every single person in this room will have their own thought about the first thing they'd like to do. Some of you will say, let's get local democracy back. Let's see that the most centralised country in the developed world. Scotland is the most centralised country in the developed world. The lowest level of democracy below the parliament of any developed country anywhere. Let's change that. Let's give politics back to communities. Let's have a country where your community, your town, your neighbourhood can govern itself and make its own decisions. Not be subjected to what Leslie, Leslie Riddick calls the, 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 uh, the Labour Local Authority syndrome of um, Stone Still La Fitchie. No, I don't need things. Just give me the money, give me the power, give me the ability to organise with my neighbours and we will sort it for ourselves. Because that's one of the things that we will do, is take the country back through democracy. Class is incredibly important and the impacts of class is where we are and the state of our nation has been, you know, I think the left has recognised for a long, long time. But as well as that, we've got to recognise that the, what the hollowing out of democracy is not accidental. It has been the only way that great power, and I mean by that the corporations and the military and the arms manufacturers, all of these people, the great power has dominated because they hollowed out democracy. So let's get democracy back in its feet and say no. The one counterbalance to what you are doing is us able to make our own decisions. And when we do, we do not make the same decisions as you. So perhaps it's local democracy. But I know that a lot of people have at the heart the importance of land reform. 
not only for its practical and economic um, benefits, but for its symbolic benefits. To see the most concentrated land ownership of any developed country in the world is wrong. The way we've used and depopulated and stripped bare the north of our fine country has been a disgrace. We are sitting on the edge of the biggest functional desert in Europe. Biodiversity is gone. Productivity is gone. Um, a, a, a land, a, a soil which can nourish things has been gone because it's been neglected and treated as a speculative asset. We can change that land value tax and a little bit of legislation, an active industrial policy which says let's find what we can do with this land, let's take it actively, let's use it to build. That would be an amazing step that we could take. What we could do is we could fix the banking sector remarkably quickly. So easy to do. And such a, when you hear this, it's never. What? All we have to do is get every local authority in Scotland to set up a bank. A boring bank, a dull bank that takes your money in, keeps a hold of it, gives you it back when you need it. Get a debit card, you get a mortgage if you need one, and a small loan occasionally if you need one. And apart from that, they'll leave you the hell alone with nobody <laughs> phoning you offering you another loan on a customer service review. And that is how they do it in successful economies. In Germany, 75% of the banking market is publicly owned. In Japan, over 80% of the banking market is either publicly or community owned. Do you know how often these banks crash? Never, because they're not doing anything dumb. And if that is the backbone of our banking market, then anyone who wants to take their money to another bank is free to do it. And if you want to take the risk and you enjoy getting phoned up about customer service reviews, you're free to go and do that. Nobody will. We will take the banking sector and move it back into safe collective ownership. So the next time that anybody tells you that we have to bail out the banks, no, we don't. We don't. Nobody should be indemnifying crazy risk-taking banks. We should be saying we will indemnify savers if there's ever a problem, not the banks. That's their responsibility. So we fix that. And we can easily fix the investment issue. Because in Britain right now, if you add up all the private, public and personal investment that's taking place, every piece of investment, Sum it all up, subtract depreciation, you get a negative number. We are actually disinvesting in Britain. We're not investing enough money now to stand still because Britain is an anti investment culture. I almost have to go on to that in the next couple of minutes. Um, but we can reverse that, we can change that. And the way that we do that is to have a bank which invests for a purpose other than speculative gain. How do we do that? Super easy. Um, if we were to set up a national investment bank, Assuming that it's not giving risky loans, which it wouldn't be, a kind of 20 to 1 liquidity ratio would be perfectly reasonable. What that means is that if we could capitalise that bank by borrowing 5 billion in the international markets, which is nothing, that bank would be able over a 20 year period to lend 100 billion pounds to infrastructure and industry in Scotland. A real national investment programme which would enable us to do what investment should do. Because one of those things is a word that I think the left ought to take back. Go and look at it. Look at it up in the dictionary. Investment. The expenditure of time, effort and money now in the belief that the future can be better. Which, bluntly, is almost a definition of my political outlook. An investment of time, effort and money now so that the future can be better than the present. We should capture that idea and take it back. A national investment bank. But what would it do? Well, a couple of things I can suggest to you. Because the other thing that we've got to do is get away from the rotten UK economy. The UK economy is predicated on low skill, high wealth extraction by the minimum number of players. That, that's it, roughly. How can you get the most out in the shortest period of time by putting the least in? That's Britain's economy. And it's why we have property developers buy a house and wait. We have retailers, big, big retailers, build a shed, close down the high street. <laughs> <clears throat> goods and services in it. You know, out of town retail kills off the high street. It's why we have banks which are predatory in their clients and their customers. Um, we have to get away from that kind of economy. Only Britain, along with France, France saw a 4% drop, but only Britain saw a significant drop in its industrial production over the last 30 years at 35% drop. Every other developed country saw increases of between 18 and 120% in their industrial production. And that's skilled labour. It's skilled labour, so you pay. And when you pay, people have decent wages. We'll that in a second, long, uh, the, So once you've, once you've got this investment bank, how do you stimulate um, a productive economy? Well, there's no time to talk about industrial policy, but the first thing we do is we see that the economy is not somehow separate from our society. 
somehow over in a box in the corner over which we have no interest, no control, because it's self-regulated. This is absolute rubbish. The economy is part of society. Our society is democratic. So if we collectively between us wish to make a democratic decision about the nature of our economy, we have the right to do that. So we have to do what successful economies do, which is intervene to create the kind of economy we want, not stand back and allow the biggest, the biggest bullies and the most powerful and wealthy to shape the economy in their own interest. And that's what Britain did. I'll give you two examples of how we can do that. There's only <coughs> one country in Europe which does not want its own national grid. I don't want to tell you who it is. So let's imagine that we weren't going to be that country. Let's imagine that we were going to take our national grid back into collective ownership, which is really easy because uh, apart from the fact that the European Union not only allows it, they encourage it. Um, let's say we do that with the minimal compensation that it would cost, because almost all of the cost is already to be compensated through your bills. They'd like to pass almost all their infrastructure, in fact, more than their infrastructure costs over to you. So we take it back. And then we can reverse the model of economic development that we currently use. Now that model says, let's find a rich landowner and a big corporation and get them together. The corporation will put turbines in the rich landowner's field, which he buys from another corporation in China. The landowner gets the rent, the corporation gets the wind and the money that comes from it. The Chinese get all the manufacturing jobs, and what do we get? We can watch our wind giving us perhaps 20% crop uh, tax of whatever we can actually grab from them. No, let's not do it like that. Let's invest with the National Investment Bank, find the land, buy it through compulsory purchase, so it's collectively owned land, build on that using collectively owned funding, um, a new generation of energy which is in collective ownership and therefore the bills are both cheaper and the revenues come back to us. We will fund it through our national investment bank with no difficulty, there's no risk, we will still be needing electricity in the future, therefore the cost will always come back. And when we do that in collective ownership, we can decide where the kit and the manufacturing gets done. We can build all those wind turbines, all those wave power generators, all of that energy storage infrastructure, we can build it all in Scotland. Tens of thousands of fabulous high pay jobs. We can do the same in housing. Housing in this country is a joke. I mean, it's, it's, it's madness. We have an entire housing policy which is purely based on how to let property speculators get rich. Seven out of ten richest people in Britain are property speculators. Alan Sugar of The Apprentice never made any money off of computers because they were all shite. <laughs> on property speculation. That Britain is not a country of entrepreneurs. You start with money and you make more money through the housing market. It makes no sense. In the last 30 years in, in, in Germany, house prices have not risen. They have deliberately used a national policy to keep house prices static. And the way that they did it was using a big programme of public sector house building, which was of a superior quality to what the private sector was doing. <coughs> and they kept the, the rates down, and it kept the housing market under control. Young professionals in Germany do not even dream of the millstone of a mortgage around their necks. They can get extremely high quality, spacious, rent, publicly rental accommodation, which is modern, which they're allowed to adapt, and which they've got long-term uh, ownership of. So let's do that. We can eat again. Housing generates all of the revenue back. You always have rents. So we borrow from this National Investment Bank over a 30 or 40 year period. We build as much housing as we want to. As much as we want to. And I suggest that we should do it in German style house factories. That in these really high specification, high quality, extremely environmentally friendly models for creating houses. High skills new generation of employment, we can do all of this stuff while also solving the housing problem. This, again, tens of thousands of new jobs. Now, I could kind of go on like this for about two or three hours. I've only got as far as um, probably, uh, what's this, it's only about October after the election. <laughs> 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 what I'm really trying to get across here, uh, for it, I'm being a little bit facetious, for anyone who hasn't seen any of this stuff, if you go to our website, allofthispersonal.org, you'll get it <coughs> six quid. Um, it's the result of uh, 50 major policy papers that we've published over the last um, year, put together in one place in plain English, which you can understand very simply. And it's being waved at many of us. It's also it's designed by our lovely friends at Tangent. It's a gorgeous thing, so I, I recommend you get to even for that. Um, and it will explain to you all the things that we can do to transform Scotland. But what is this about? What this is about fundamentally at the end is a couple of things that nobody properly tells you. The first thing that people aren't really probably telling you, when they say we're rich, 
But let's see what that means. We have got the stuff, not the money, but the stuff of which successful countries are made. The resources, the geostrategic position, the people, the skills, the education, the history, and the infrastructure. We have all of this stuff. We are so far ahead of almost every other nation in the country in these terms that I can't understand why the viability question is even on the table. We have a will to do this. Oh, spare me from another upper middle class professor, professor on a salary of 70k plus. <laughs> <laughs> over and over and over again in this country to elect socially democratic governments. In fact, since the evolution, I would argue it strongly, that we have elected the most left-wing government that was available every time. And if that's not good enough for the who's left in Labour and is not Labour for Indy, who, who, who actually stand on platforms and say we're not a socialist country, well, be damned. Because we are. And we will make that choice again. We have our will. We have the resources. What we don't have is the powers. The thing which they never tell you, they never probably tell you, is the key thing about independence is independence gives you power. That's the point of it. It's not giving Alex Salmon power, it's not giving Hollywood power. It gives you power for one simple reason, that you will have a voice that is 12 times louder. We will create a country in which what you think and what you feel is 12 times louder than it is in the UK, where there are so many of us that they can just pit one against the other and ignore us. I fundamentally believe in smaller countries. I fundamentally believe in smaller democracies, because I fundamentally believe that only when we have loud voices as individuals, as people, as citizens, as communities, as neighbours, and as friends, only when our voices are loud will we ever manage to tame parliaments and make them deliver what works for us. If you've got a parliament that's 500 miles away, this is one minute, isn't it? If, if you've got a parliament that's 500 miles away uh, and, it's got, and it's a country of 65 million people, it can pretty well do whatever it wants, as we have seen. But if you get a country, if you get a parliament that's stuck in a country where the people can see it, they can touch it, they can breathe down its neck, and they can say, no, not good enough. This is not what we elected you for. If we can create that, we can create a parliament that actually works for us. Is it possible? Yes. Because look, everywhere that a country has done anything good like this, is always one of two things is true. They either have massive amounts of internal devolution, say like Germany with its very strong landers, or they're small. So let's not head ourselves on that small is a disadvantage. It's the single biggest advantage that we've got in our hands, a small country that reflects its people. That, for me, is the future. It's the future for the whole of the world. I dream one day when we defederate the United States of America so that Vermont is not stuck with Texas' dumb gun laws, and Texas isn't stuck with those pesky healthcare things that Vermontians want. Let's get to a world where democracy reflects what people want, and then when we do, we will start to realise that what they told you is possible is not true, and what you want is possible. And that's all that we need to be told. What you want is possible. You have everything you need to do it. All you've got to do is vote yes and get on with it. If only, if only, this is what we've been told every day, this election, this referendum would be in the bag. Go and tell your pals, we're going to win this, and see what we do. They're going to be so amazed at what we achieve next time. Thanks. Yeah.